Well, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming to Brookings. Uh, we are delighted to welcome Pascal Lamy, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, uh, and, uh, and Kemal Dervish, the Vice President of uh, Brookings here, who runs our Global Economy and Development Program, and all of you, welcome. Uh, we are fortunate from time to time to have world leaders uh, on the Brookings stage, and today we can thank the person sitting next to uh, Pascal for that. As you all know, Kamal runs our Global Economy and Development Program, and before that, he was a former leader himself as the head of the UN Development Program, and before that, uh, a, a distinguished career, career at Princeton, at the World Bank, and as the Finance Minister of Turkey. And through him, we're lucky to have uh, Pascal. For two or three people out there who do not know Pascal's career, um, he has served as the Director General of the World Trade Organization since September 2005, and before that was Trade Commissioner at the European uh, Commission from 1999 to 2004. He became the EU's Trade Commissioner just after the U.S. and EU launched the WTO as an organization, and they were trying to launch its first round as a new organization at that wonderfully organized meeting in Seattle that a number of us had the pleasure of attending. Almost two years later, that round finally launched at Doha in 2001, less than two months after the 9-11 attacks, and that was thanks to the tireless work of Pascal and his good friend Bob Zellick, a friend to many in the room here, uh, now, 13 years after Seattle, 11 years after Doha, we are still in the middle of a very complicated and difficult trade round. Pascal has led the WTO in that time period with patience, perseverance, and passion, and he has needed all of those qualities. He uh, and over 150 trade ministers are now dealing with a far more complicated global situation than the one that faced uh, them and us just over a decade ago. Back then, world trade still largely focused on the export of raw materials from one nation, the manufacture of finished products in another, and the sale of those goods overseas. Poor and developing countries were still largely focused on agricultural exports and very basic manufactured goods, and were hoping that Doha would see a breakthrough, eliminating U.S. and EU subsidies and quotas in agriculture and basic manufacturing. The trade and services was still relatively limited to a small list of high value added activities. Indian call centers were in their infancy. China had just fully joined the WTO and no one spoke of emerging markets, a phrase uh, coined by a Brookings trustee, Antoine von Ockmel. Regional trading relationships were just beginning to challenge the WTO. Back then, most phones still had cords most music listeners had just made the transition from vinyl to CDs, and almost all television still had tubes. Uh, the conflict between trade laws and other global treaty obligations were only starting to be questioned by non-governmental organizations. Now, 13 years later, and 11 years after Doha, our products and our politics have become ever more complicated. To give a glimpse, my iPhone functions as a phone, a record player, a newspaper, a television, and a post office and especially when my kids grab it as a video arcade. As Pascal will discuss, the materials assembly, intellectual property, manufacture, labor, and energy that goes into making this phone is not only managed by the WTO, but also potentially touches on a network of other global and regional agreements. On top of that, the global financial crisis put millions out of work and led to a surge in government spending and subsidies to favored industries. Pascal and others have tried to sort out which subsidies and taxes are allowable and which are protectionist practices. In other words, the rise in global supply chains, non-tariff measures, and other global public goods, and the onslaught of a global crisis have all conspired to make Pascal's job among the hardest in the world. Yet even with all those headwinds, Pascal will probably still be the first to tell you global trade is responsible for some extraordinary accomplishments. Those gains have continued to come in the last decade, and they could not have happened without the dedicated work of Pascal and his not-so-merry band of trade diplomats who helped to build this current system. So the global manufacturing and services boom has promoted, promoted enormous development for people in emerging markets worldwide, helping to lift hundreds of millions out of poverty, and developed countries have benefited too with trade helping dramatically lower the cost of goods and services to people across America Europe, Japan, and elsewhere. 
So we are very lucky indeed to have someone of the intellectual breadth and physical stamina of Pascal at the center of these issues and negotiations. So with that, the Director General will speak to us for a few minutes and then he and Kamal will speak with you all uh, in a conversation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Pascal Ami. Well, thanks, uh, Bill, uh, for your uh, kind words. Uh, topic of these remarks is uh, looking at uh, trade in the future, a very uncertain future, and the one thing we can say for sure about the future that it will differ from the present. I, I think uh, history has been a good guide to the future, and the recent uh, past has brought so many startling changes that uh, the future certainly promises more of the unexpected. In the last uh, decade alone, as uh, Bill was saying, China has uh, risen to become the uh, world's uh, second largest economic power and its biggest exporter of goods. The Arab Spring has swept away uh, long uh, established regimes with consequences uh, uh, still to be determined. The global economy has been shaken by a series of uh, cataclysmic events which uh, may have been foretold but for which we certainly were not prepared. Uh, U.S. and uh, Japanese uh, debt levels have uh, risen to unprecedented heights. Europe's uh, experiment in generating uh, serious uh, supranational governance is being uh, severely tested. On the other side, uh, skeptics and optimists alike have been surprised to see uh, important uh, Millennium Development Goals, uh, like halving uh, the global rate of extreme poverty or slashing by half the proportion of people without access to clean water achieved uh, five years ahead of the 2015 deadline. The way uh, we talk to each other is uh, nothing like it was 20 years ago. Uh, Human interaction, and that's already been said by Bill, has been transformed by social networks, application software, mobile telephones, iPad, and so on. And who could have possibly uh, imagined uh, even two or three years ago that a baseball team from Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, would be within a striking distance of the World Series for the first time uh, since uh, 1924, when uh, Calvin Coolidge was president. So what's true for geopolitics, for technology, or even for baseball, uh, is true as well uh, for trade. Advances in uh, technology and transportation uh, systems have slashed the expense and the uncertainty of distance. The rapid growth of a global value change, the rising use of a regulatory-based, non-tariff measures, and the shift in uh, trade patterns as uh, South-South trade grows rapidly, have totally transformed trade in the last decade. And I believe that these forces will keep transforming trade in the uh, 10 years ahead. Uh, trade as a share of uh, global GDP has risen from roughly 40% in the 80s to around 60% today. In the US, uh, a country uh, long considered less dependent on trade than many others, uh, this share has risen from 10 to 25% over the same period of time. The US exports of goods and services in the last 10 years have uh, more than doubled uh, to over uh, 2 trillion. One reason for this uh, dramatic expansion is that U.S. exporters have entered new markets in a big way. Uh, when China entered the WTO in uh, 2001, uh, U.S. exports to the Middle Kingdom were 20 billion. 2011, uh, 100 billion, five-fold more. In addition to uh, the well-known case of China, uh, many new trading powers have emerged. Brazil, India, Mexico, Malaysia are now in the top uh, 25 leading exporters table, and all uh, posted uh, 
export growth of 15% or more uh, in uh, 2011. And today, developing countries' uh, share of trade is about 50%, compared with a, a global share of around one-third uh, in 08. Probably more important, the nature of trade has uh, also changed. High-tech uh, product uh, used to be made in uh, US, Japan, Germany. Uh, today, they are uh, made in the world with uh, components and parts uh, fabricated in uh, many countries. The country where the final assembly takes place may contribute only to a small fraction of the uh, final uh, added value of the uh, product. Today, nearly 60% of the volume of world merchandise trade is trade in components. In Asia, this figure is roughly uh, two-thirds. The import content of average uh, export worldwide is uh, 40% up from 20% uh, uh, two decades ago. So these value chains have uh, not only changed the way companies trade, uh, they are also changing the nature of the trade debate. Uh, when uh, products uh, were made in a single country uh, by a single company, the argument that uh, export were goods and uh, import bad uh, were uh, more easily defended. This mercantilist approach uh, was, uh, for centuries, a driving force of trade policy, as, by the way, uh, was the concept of reciprocity, which derived directly from this uh, vision. Global value chains have turned all of this on its head. Uh, companies uh, wishing to be uh, globally competitive in a fierce marketplace need access to the best possible inputs, goods, services, at the lowest uh, possible prices. Hindering uh, companies from uh, seeking uh, such imports uh, only renders them less competitive globally. It's become just self-defeating. And this fact, uh, together with the uh, strict monitoring by the WTO probably explains why uh, governments have uh, largely resisted the wide-scale application of trade restrictive measures on imports since the beginning of the crisis, although, as we know, we've seen uh, slippages uh, here and there. Now, not everyone uh, has uh, fully understood this uh, important shift. But the debate is evolving, uh, starting with uh, the way we measure trade. If we were to measure trade uh, in value-added uh, rather than gross uh, statistical terms, uh, bilateral balances, for instance, would look very different. True, uh, the iPhone is assembled in China, uh, but the goods and services leading to the final assembly uh, come from uh, 15 uh, different companies in many different countries. The value added to the iPhone in China is around 4%, far less than uh, the value added in the US, Japan, Germany, South Korea. Yet a uh, $400 iPhone uh, is sold in the United States, uh, standard trade accounting lists it as $400 credit to China's uh, side of the ledger and uh, $400 uh, debit uh, for the United States. WTO uh, economists uh, believe that uh, China's uh, sort of $300 billion trade surplus with the US would be reduced by half if uh, two-way trade uh, were to be measured in uh, value-added terms. And given the tremendous importance of this bilateral relationship for both countries, and by the way, for the rest of the world, uh, I believe uh, looking a bit more closely at these numbers uh, really uh, makes sense. The broader uh, trend uh, to use more uh, 
of global supply chains uh, is likely to grow as will competition to host uh, these production facilities. And the cost of labor is by no means the only variable companies consider when deciding where to manufacture or where to source their component. Uh, sound uh, domestic policies, good education, adequate social services, business environment, uh, quality infrastructure have become uh, critical elements in determining where foreign direct investment in order to localize these production facilities will uh, flow in the future. And this explains <coughs> why uh, many companies uh, building everything from aircraft to uh, automobiles to uh, furniture and paddocks uh, have increased investment in uh, US-based production facilities. I don't intend to enter into this uh, offshoring, onshoring polemic that I know is rather heated in this country. Uh, but the point is that uh, companies from around the world uh, continue to invest billions of dollars in bricks and mortar in the US. And one uh, often overlooked area of policy which has a growing impact on uh, competitiveness as a uh, global value chains disseminate production is uh, customs procedures. The longer a producer has to wait for the needed important component, the less competitive uh, she or he uh, becomes. Uh, clearing a container in uh, one day instead of uh, one week has become uh, probably much more important than uh, coping with the 10% uh, industrial tariff. Uh, trade facilitation, also happens to be uh, one area of rulemaking where we may be able uh, to uh, reach a uh, WTO uh, deal in a reasonable future. Customs procedures, uh, paperwork, border delays uh, today comprise uh, roughly 10% of the value of world trade, which is 10% of $1.4 trillion. A Trade facilitation in the WTO to curtail uh, fees, uh, paperwork, uh, create greater transparency, reduce obstacles to, re to goods in transit, would cost those costs in half. So half of 10% of $1.4 trillion pot available. Now, in this new world of trade, tariffs are less of a problem when doing business in foreign markets. They, they have not disappeared. They remain uh, high, too high on certain products. Uh, and uh, recent increases in uh, applied tariff by certain WTO members have again brought to the forefront the value of uh, slashing uh, tariff ceilings in the WTO. Uh, in our jargon, absorbing the water between bound tariffs, uh, ceiling tariffs, and applied tariffs. But in the meantime, uh, governments are implementing a whole variety of non-tariff measures uh, which uh, impact these new trade flows and sometimes uh, profoundly. These measures are regulatory mm -hmm. in nature and are aimed at uh, protecting uh, consumers' uh, health, safety, or even uh, culture or lifestyle. Uh, and they include uh, areas like uh, standards, uh, norms, uh, testing, uh, certification uh, procedures. But removing these types of regulations, as we used to try and remove tariffs, is often uh, neither desirable nor politically feasible. And the challenge for uh, the WTO and other multilateral organizations is therefore not necessarily scaling back these measures, but seeking uh, to reduce the discrepancies between them so that they do not conflict or do not unnecessarily uh, restrict uh, trade, a different way of uh, leveling the playing field. And as uh, 
bilateral or regional uh, preferential trading agreements multiply, uh, the risk of disharmony between non-tariff measures uh, threatens to grow. Uh, these uh, trading arrangements uh, often include elements not covered by the WTO agreements, such as uh, social or environmental standards, method of recognition of standards or qualifications, and there is an obvious danger that the regulatory elements of each of these accords may not only differ, but clash, uh, creating uh, perhaps uh, unintended but very uh, real uh, barriers to trade. So global uh, trade cooperation uh, is still needed to address uh, these measures. And yet, as we know, uh, the international uh, economic crisis has uh, drained much of the uh, political energy uh, which we need uh, in the uh, multilateral system. It's now pretty clear to everybody that uh, the goal of achieving a Doha package uh, encompassing uh, 20 topics among the 157 members uh, is out of reach in the short term. But in this difficult environment, the possibility still exists uh, in advancing in uh, smaller steps in a variety of areas. We saw this uh, happening uh, with a recent agreement on the uh, government procurement agreement uh, and with uh, the recent uh, deal on uh, simplification of the accession to of least developed countries uh, to the WTO. Members are presently uh, negotiating a new version of the information technology agreement, the ITA, which has been a win-win deal and uh, I think good progress uh, can be made uh, on such a major issue of international trade today in the coming uh, month. A group of uh, WTO members have uh, also embarked on a plurilateral negotiation to reach a deal to further open trade in services. No need to say that they are a key element uh, component of our economies and a key driver of the competitiveness of our industries. And this is why I believe uh, that these uh, efforts are welcome and that uh, they should be uh, made to negotiate it in an open manner, encompassing a maximum of WTO members uh, and uh, with a high level of uh, ambition. We need as well uh, short term uh, to consider, uh, for instance, how to uh, multilateralize uh, this uh, welcome uh, recent uh, agreement in uh, APEC on uh, environmental uh, goods. Now, if the WTO's uh, negotiating function uh, has been, let's say, disappointing in recent times, uh, the organization uh, has become uh, more effective in uh, other areas, in monitoring, tracking, uh, reporting uh, on trade developments, whether trade restrictive or trade opening. Uh, our role has uh, grown uh, through the monitoring of uh, the measures uh, taken since the beginning of the crisis. The WTO dispute settlement system continues to be the most uh, effective mechanism of its kind. I know that uh, some lawyers in uh, Washington have not always been happy with the outcomes uh, produced in uh, Geneva, uh, but the fact that the uh, US is the most uh, active participant in dispute settlement uh, indicates a sort of, in a factual way, uh, the degree of confidence that uh, the US government and US companies have in our ability to resolve these disputes effectively. In an atmosphere of uh, escalating trade tensions, this dispute settlement mechanism has taken uh, the heat out of disputes through a process uh, which is uh, rules-based, predictable, and, and uh, most importantly, respected. 
And it's, I think, no accident that uh, we've already had uh, nearly three times as many cases filed uh, this year as in uh, 11. In other ways, too, uh, the WTO has become more effective. Our coherence work with the UN system, the Bretton Woods institutions, regional development banks have never been closer. The Aid for Trade program, which I just discussed with the president of the World Bank, uh, is uh, an evidence of this global partnership uh, to build a productive capacity in uh, developing countries. We've together, and I discussed this, this morning at the IFC, uh, helped uh, avert a shutdown in trade finance to uh, businesses, banks in uh, countries in the uh, developing world. So, to conclude, what, uh, what of the future? How will uh, the WTO adapt to these very rapidly changing circumstances, which I believe will keep changing in the near future? To help uh, provide answer to this question, I have uh, assembled a panel of uh, 12 experts with a uh, U.S. Uh, contribution uh, of Tom uh, Donahue from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to report on their findings by beginning of next year. One thing we can be certain, uh, the role of uh, emerging countries in trade as uh, elsewhere will continue to grow. We are in a multipolar world, certainly in trade. Uh, Harboring many centers of influence uh, lends uh, greater legitimacy to the work of the WTO, but it also uh, brings uh, greater complexity to global uh, decision uh, making. A global consensus is needed on the role of trade for growth, for job creation, for development, for poverty alleviation, and in many ways, I think it's time for us to restate why and how uh, this virtuous uh, causality uh, link uh, works. Once we've done that, and again, I think we need to redo that, uh, this debate uh, will not succeed without higher, uh, more determined uh, political will. And it can be built. Uh, Fifty years ago, uh, President uh, Kennedy uh, signed the uh, Trade Expansion Act. October 1962 was a time of uncertainty. The world at the time was uh, grippled by the uh, Cuban uh, Missile Crisis. The U.S. was looking with some perplexity at the uh, consolidation of the uh, European common market. And yet, and yet, uh, President Kennedy noted uh, it was uh, no time to stagnate behind tariff walls, uh, but to promote uh, increased uh, economic activity through increased uh, trade. Now, we face uh, lots of uncertainty, like in 1962, we know future will bring uh, unexpected events, uh, unpredictable consequences, but there is also something we know, uh, which is that these uh, challenges uh, will be uh, no less complex, nor uh, challenging than those we face today. And in fact, there is every reason to believe that the uh, economic, social, environmental conditions uh, we have uh, created today will make these uh, changes uh, and challenges even more difficult to deal with. But one thing is, I believe for sure, uh, which is that uh, more openness is needed. Openness of trade, openness of minds. And I look forward to uh, Brookings uh, keeping uh, leading this debate. Thanks for your attention.
Krishna, thank you very much for coming. I know it's a very short trip and you took time to visit us. And uh, Your last sentence particularly will encourage us a lot. Um, I think Pascal Lamy is, you know, is the head of the WTO, as Bill Antolis said, but he's a thinker, uh, a leader on all issues relating to the world economy, to Europe. And I, I will warn you, I will have one question on Europe before we open it to the floor. Because Pascal, of course, worked with Jacques Delors, and uh, he's one of the uh, architects of the European Peace Project, which I still re think remains one of the most impressive projects that world history has produced, although it is, of course, facing these huge challenges. So I'll start by asking a, a few questions, and then we'll open it up for debate. Now, there's one question. You started almost at the beginning of your speech, Pascal, uh, underlining the difference between looking at trade from the point of view of final, final products, what we measure in the balance of payments, and the value added that lies behind that. And I think this is a, uh, you took the initiative, I think, yourself in launching data work on this because we, while we can, you know, we can comprehend the idea, there's no systematic data that was available to kind of look at this. And I think this is very, very important given the degree of interdependence that, has, that exists now and, and, and the kind of productivity increases that are linked to it, but also some of the imbalances and, and problems in, in political economy. But my question is the following. You know, when you look at it from the micro side, you have flows of goods going back and forth. But when you look at it from the macro side, the current account deficit of a country is the difference between total investment in that country and total savings, okay? And that will remain true no matter how you measure the flow of the goods or of the value added. And this is a, you know, a challenging kind of conundrum in a way. I must say quite, I mean, I've thought about it, but I haven't come to the, fully to the grips with it. You said, for example, I think you said the China-US deficit would be only half of what it is if it was measured in value added. Okay. But the current accounts of China and the US will remain the same. So how, how, how do you explain that? How, how can you help us think this through? I mean, you're absolutely correct. Uh, measuring trade in added value will not change the fact that the US has an overall trade deficit and that China has an overall trade surplus. Uh, it will simply give a totally different picture of where is this made of? Right. Huh? Well, years ago, uh, US had a big trade deficit with Japan. Uh, now, uh, China has a big trade deficit with Japan. And US has a big trade deficit with China. Huh? Because a large part of what China ships to the US uh, comes from Japan. And this is a confirmation of what we all know, huh? which is that current account imbalances are not trade related. They have to do with macroeconomic realities, which basically is uh, the uh, relative proportion of uh, investment, uh, consumption, uh, savings. So all economists know that the trade balance is the other side of a macroeconomic balance. But what measuring trade in added value helps doing is realizing that this is not a trade problem. And by the way, probably even more importantly, that these imbalances cannot be corrected through trade measures. And that's something, again, which we, we've known for a long time. Simply the way we measure trade until now couldn't help us realizing this. Now, the first uh, numbers uh, for, I think, uh, uh, 60 countries or so uh, will appear uh, at the end of this year. Uh, we've been working, as you said, very hard for the last uh, three or four years with a whole network of uh, academics, uh, uh, 
statistician, uh, OECD, which been, has been doing the heavy uh, workload. Uh, it's, by the way, a very interesting way of, of sort of a network of various bits and pieces, places, uh, the ability of which to uh, collect these, these numbers and put them together is incredibly helped by, you know, internet uh, uh, and, and other systems. And I think the moment we start looking at these new numbers will change the way we look at that. And, of course, with, I hope, positive consequences on the trade debate. Uh, everybody knows that in the US, for instance, and not only during electoral campaigns, uh, there's a huge sort of, you know, China focus and the bilateral trade deficit between US and China, the way we measure it today, just, you know, hypes this right. as a formidable issue, whereas if you look at it properly, what really matters in trade policies at the end of the day for the people is whether it's job creating, job disrupting. We know it is both creating and job Stop disrupting. We know that overall, for a country like this one, trade participation enhances the quality of jobs. Not always the numbers, but the quality. I think this is a very interesting and very important answer. And I think the work that we were really very impatient to see, we got glimpses of it, uh, is going to change a lot of the way we think about the world economy. So I really congratulate you and all the network with whom you work. I mean, just to kind of, I hope, clarify a little, I mean, not clarify, but add to what uh, Pascal said, maybe uh, part of the problem that the U.S. thinks is with China is that actually Germany and Japan are exporting some of the stuff to China that the U.S. could be exporting or should be exporting from a U.S. point of view. And that is more the point than just looking at the bilateral Chinese-U.S. balances. And I think to have the data to illustrate that and to analyze that will be a, a really a great contribution to the analysis of, of the world economy. My, my second question, Pascal, is, you know, across the street we have our competitors the Peterson Institute. <laughs> actually, some of them are down here. <laughs> uh, no, actually, they're all over there. And Fred Bergson, you know, keeps saying that the WTO should be used as a tool to fight against what he thinks are unfair exchange rate policies. And there should be trade sanctions uh, attached to um, macroeconomic and reserve policies that, uh, that go against uh, the kind of m purely market determined, whatever that means, equilibrium in, in exchange rates. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I have a very different view. I think, I think that um, you know, uh, using the WTO for all kinds of purposes, from environmental to macro to exchange rate, is quite a dangerous matter. But I wonder, particularly on the exchange rate issue and on, you know, and on managing global imbalances in the exchange rate, and it's very much, a, a, of course, an issue which was until, very, until Europe, the Euro crisis took over almost all the space, which was at the center of the G20 discussions we, you, you were, of course, a participant in. But what do you think about the kind of relationship IMF, WTO, trade, and current account deficits and exchange rates? <laughs> uh, well, there's the, there's the lawyer answer to your question, there's the economist answer to your question, and then there's the politician answer to your question. <laughs> okay? Now, the lawyer's question is as follows. And I always have to be very careful because my lawyers are extremely serious people, and when I'm in public, <laughs> uh, I have to really watch my steps. But what lawyers would say is sanctions, Fred, uh, Bergson, and Mike, are about breaching rules. And that uh, there's no rule that 
would bind a country in today's international system, whether in WTO <coughs> or in the IMF, that says that you have to have a free market on your currency. You can choose your exchange rate regime. There's nothing like a rule which would imply that, again, your current account uh, must be uh, free <coughs> and that uh, your uh, currency must be traded uh, on a normal market. Now, the same lawyer, hence, sanctions for what rules? Unless such a rule would need to be built. <coughs> now, the same lawyer would say, mind you, there is an Article 15 of GATT, which the Legion said was uh, written by uh, Lord Keynes himself, and which basically says that on the one side you cannot frustrate your trade opening commitment through exchange action, whatever that means, you know that. <laughs> and that, in the same article, uh, recalls the commitment which IMF members have between themselves, which say that you cannot frustrate uh, your uh, exchange, I mean, your exchange rate system through trade action. But the same lawyer, and I'll finish this on the lawyer side, uh, would say, yeah, but that was written at a time uh, of fixed exchange rates, which is true. And that this Article 15 GATT rule uh, has never been tested in any dispute. Okay. So what would the economists say? The economists would say, <coughs> on the one hand, <laughs> on the other hand, very complex question. <laughs> And by the way, that's what is happening in a debate which we have restarted in WTO after six years of a flat uh, electroencephalogram on uh, <coughs> trade and currencies. Why? Because Brazil, uh, two years ago, which had started the sort of crusade on uh, currency wars and the rest, uh, asked for this to happen. For the last two years, we've had a very good, scientific, uh, academically loaded debate uh, about this, uh, which leads to a very complex sequence, uh, uh, which is, uh, is an exchange rate uh, undervalued or overvalued? Uh, is, uh, does this have a consequence on trade flows? Uh, if you take the, the example of China and assume China's exports have a 50% China added value, if you reevaluate the renminbi, uh, for sure it will affect short term the competitiveness of Chinese exports on the export side, uh, but it will seriously improve the import capacity and pricing of China. Uh, so then you have to make the whole demonstration that it really, so, and for the moment, for the moment, there is no clear-cut conclusion to that. What we know is that sometimes exchange rates do impact uh, short-term uh, trade flows, depending on how firms absorb or do not absorb these variations in their profit margins, depending on their capacity to hedge or not hedge on the number of markets. So, very, very complex. Yeah. And, uh, you know, let's leave China aside uh, for the moment, uh, uh, because we're in Washington, uh, and let's you look at uh, what uh, Switzerland has been doing uh, for the last year in capping uh, its uh, exchange rate uh, to uh, 120 uh, Swiss franc to the euro. Yeah. Through what Lord Keynes would have called exchange rate action. Uh, does anybody have a problem with Switzerland doing this? Not that I'm aware. Look at the graph, which is uh, the re 
real exchange rate of the Korean currency for the last 20 years, real weighted exchange rate, you'll see a picture which looks like exchange rate action. Has anybody complained? No. Now, fine. Then for the politician uh, 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 answer, uh, the politician answer is that the place where exchange rates are meant to be seen as overvalued or undervalued is not the WTO, but the IMF Washington. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, I like the economists on the one hand. On the other hand, very complicated and so on. We'll have to try to simplify it. But uh, I think it is an important question. And I, 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 my own feeling, frankly, is that the WTO has in its own field been very effective. It's one of the most effective actually organizations in terms of global governance in its own field, obviously. And putting all the burden of all kinds of things on, on the one, because through trade you can affect the other, I think is in itself a somewhat dangerous uh, enterprise. So I do disagree with my colleague and friend across the street on that one. Now let me ask you the last question and link it to Europe a little bit before opening up to the the floor, but it is actually connected to the last one. Despite the fact that the European Union has never, I mean, has claimed to uh, want Turkey to be a member, but you know, and but it's not about to happen tomorrow. And I am a very fervent European as, as a Turk. But um, when you look at Europe going through this major crisis, I computed um, some of these balances. Okay. The first fact is that Germany now has the largest current account surplus in the world in absolute terms, larger than China. The second, I think, even more interesting fact is that if you take Northern Europe, the Northern European countries, although some of them are not in the Eurozone, some of them are, but Switzerland, for example, closely pegs to the, to the Euro, so does Denmark, Sweden and Norway is a little bit of a different question. But if you actually take Northern Europe, the current account surplus of the last 12 months of Northern Europe is about $520 billion. Larger than, ever, than the Chinese surplus ever was. Now, through, you know, through the same kind of reasons we criticize China, is it not fair to criticize Northern Europe in similar terms? It's a question. I'm not affirming it both from the point of view of you know, just global balances and global macroeconomics, subtracting $500 billion from effective demand in the world economy, but also very much, of course, from the point of view of the European debate. Um, and here I will say something which I heard with my own ears. You know, a Northern European finance minister in Davos, he was asked, what is, what is the secret of your success? By the way, it wasn't the German finance minister. Um, he said, well, very simple. You have to have a current account surplus and a budget surplus. And since we cannot trade with outer space, it's not feasible, of course, to do that worldwide. But anyway, what about this Northern European huge and growing current account surplus? I mean, it's just a confirmation of what we said a moment ago that uh, these current imbalances have nothing to do with trade policy. Because by definition, EU members have the same trade policy. Uh, so it's a good test case of why this is not the problem and why it cannot be addressed through trade policy action. It's a macroeconomic problem. It is a competitiveness problem, and we know that part of the present uh, crisis in the euro system has to do with too much divergence in, uh, in uh, competitive uh, realities of, of the economies. Uh, and that's something which <coughs> us, or more precisely, the ones which were the diplomats at the time that decided on the disciplines of the Eurozone had missed. 
No. Not that the issue had not been raised. Uh, if you take the Delors report that preceded Maastricht, there is quite a lot of that sort of you know, solidarity, competitiveness issue in his report. But for reasons which are their reasons, uh, diplomats took in that what they thought would be acceptable to their governments and populations and not what was not acceptable. But this needs to be fixed. And it, in a way, it is slowly being fixed, probably in conditions uh, which are uh, socially and economically not good, but it is what's happening for the moment. Uh, I spent uh, two hours with, uh, uh, with Mario Monti a uh, fortnight ago in Rome. That's what he's doing. Now, of course, he's doing it the hard way. Uh, it probably would have been much better uh, to do it within a system of disciplines that would have been uh, more binding, including in the case of Greece. But Keynes would have said that at least part of the adjustment should be done by the Northern European surplus countries. But th this, this, is, this is what will happen with time. As it is, by the way, this is what's happening with the Chinese surplus. It's happening with the Chinese because it's happening. they actually have an appreciating real exchange rate and the macroeconomic consequences of it. Moderately. But if, yeah. Moderately. But That's the IMF. Shouldn't speak. Should, <laughs> shouldn't German wages rise much faster? And I think, I think it will happen. It will happen. I sure hope so. I, it will happen. All right, let's, let's turn to the floor now for some questions and answers. Uri, you're always fast, <laughs> even on the tennis court. <laughs> I have a pressing question, yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much, Pascal, for the uh, masterly review of uh, trade relations. And also, uh, uh, Kemal, for your excellent questions today. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, my question is about multilateral negotiations. Uh, many have come to the conclusion that uh, we are not ever going to make progress uh, through, again, through a round that includes 150 countries trying to decide, as you put it, on 20 different highly complex agenda items. So the proposal has been made that more uh, should be done through plurilateral uh, negotiations, you mentioned those as well. I'd like to understand from you uh, what you see as the obstacles to plurilateral negotiations. Is it in fact inevitable that before we launch a plurilateral negotiation, we have to have agreement of all the members to launch a, a plurilateral negotiation, which of course is an enormous constraint. Is it in fact the case uh, that in order for a plurilateral negotiation to be concluded, it has to be done on an MFN basis, which means that everybody, uh, uh, everybody benefits, even those who did not participate in the agreement, uh, leading to all sorts of free rider and uh, uh, deterrence on the part of countries that do uh, want to engage in agreement. Um, well, multilateral negotiations are not difficult because they are multilateral. They are difficult because so far, and that's the evidence of the do around, there was no convergence between a few very major players. Like in the UK round, which only unfolded when uh, EU US converged on an issue which they hadn't been able to solve before. And that's what happened uh, to the Dura round on one specific issue. At the time, the US EU problem was agriculture, this time, the US China problem was industrial tariffs. So it's not so much a multilateral problem. 
Huh? If US and EU, if US and China would agree on a compromise on industrial tariff reduction, I can tell you the whole picture would change. Now, plurilaterals. You've got, as you know, you it, two sorts of plurilaterals. Huh? Closed plurilaterals and open multilaterals. Plurilaterals. Closed plurilaterals like the government procurement agreement, which are done on a pure reciprocity basis. Only the members of the club benefit from the trade opening they do between themselves. And by the way, this necessitates a specific decision by all WTO members that they accept some of these members to do a closed plurilateral but for services where there's an Article 5 that allows this to happen without a waiver. But the government procurement agreement is covered by a waiver where all WTO members have accepted that government procurement is treated this way. Now, that's one version. Then the other version, which is the one you mentioned, is the open plurilateral, where a number of countries start trying to build a critical mass. And when this critical mass of, let's say, 80, 90% of trade is there, they clinch a deal and they open the benefit of this deal to de minimis, which is the remaining uh, 10 or 15% or 20% of world trade. The problem being that in today's world of trade, an open plurilateral without both US and China in the deal is not doable, doesn't make sense. So in a way you're back to the starting point which is that you need uh, US and China to agree. So in many ways there's no difference between a multilateral deal and a prelateral deal as long as you talk about an open prelateral deal. This is what probably can happen with the ITA2, uh, the Information Technology Agreement number two, which is the one that where US and China are both working in this direction. This is what happened in this uh, Vladivostok uh, APEC deal on environmental goods, where there was an APEC agreement to go to 5% uh, in uh, environmental goods tariffs, which is the one we might be trying to multilateralize in WTO. So, in a way, it's not the fact that it's multilateral or plurilateral, as long as it's open, is the fact that US and China can or cannot agree. Yes? Please do identify yourself for the rest uh, of you. Sure, uh, sure. My name is Andrei Sitov. I'm a Russian reporter. And uh, thank you for mentioning Vladivostok. It gives me an opening. Uh, <laughs> Russia probably uh, nice played, played, yes, uh, pl played a role in uh, that result because it was interested in achieving a result uh, in Vladivostok. Maybe it uh, <laughs> leaned a little bit on uh, the U.S., on uh, China uh, to achieve that. But it's just conjecture. Uh, I, I, if you remember, sir, I used to ask you over the years how soon uh, Russia will be uh, in the WTO. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it was almost a game, at least for me. Now that Russia is in the WTO, I want to ask you not only uh, what you still ex uh, expect from Russia, but also what Russia can probably do for the organization and the uh, current uh, situation uh, for itself and for, for the world to get out of the crisis. Thank you. Look, uh, Russia is a new, fresh uh, member of the organization, and as uh, experience shows, uh, there'll be a bit of time to learn, uh, get acquainted. Uh, with uh, the uh, special uh, life of this uh, tribe, uh, which has uh, its own specificities, uh, rules, uh, rights, uh, feathers, a war of peace. It takes a bit of time to get acquainted to that. 
uh, and probably you can find a good sort of anthropological uh, uh, description of, of the way the system works. Uh, obviously, this takes a bit of time. Uh, and China entered into the WTO, and there is often, the media often compare China's and Russia's entry, sort of, you know, 10 years later, uh, it's, it's very different. Uh, it's the, the main point of Russia entering the organization, in a way, is similar to China entering the organization, which is to provide political energy for the modernization of the country under the constraint of multilateral rules which have been subscribed. But true, this will take a different rhythm, a different shape, given the fact that as compared to uh, China at the time, the Russian economy is still little diversified uh, in international trade. Uh, we still have 70 plus percent of uh, Russia's external trade. Uh, which is uh, which is in uh, in uh, basic uh, fuels, uh, minerals, and uh, and sort of basic commodities. So the good news for the others is that they will have an important new partner. You know, WTO without Russia was not really a world trade organization. So, but that's medium uh, medium term. Short term, the only real good news is that uh, Russia will uh, contribute to the WTO budget, uh, <laughs> which will reduce uh, the fees of the others. <laughs> uh, yes, you have a question there? We have a few more minutes. No, no yeah. sorry. I, I wanted to go to the first. Yeah, that's right. I, I'll, go, I'll come to you after that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Adriana Herrera from SAIS. I would like to, to um, Good know thing you're not from Peterson. I was going to be <laughs> afraid. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think that the private sector could uh, play a major role in order to impulse or to get the, the political will to unlock the, the hard negotiations? Okay. I'm going to take two, two more questions, three in all, Pascal, if it's okay with you, and then give you the, yeah. Yes, uh, it's Adam B. Sudi from Inside US Trade. I just, given that the last ministerial, there was outcomes on uh, GPA and Russia as a session, of course, um, but we saw no big outcomes on broader multilateral initiatives within the Doha round. Um, what is your hope for delivering a, a package in 2013 at the Indonesia ministerial? And how important will an early harvest uh, package be to sort of proving uh, the WTO's credibility as a negotiating body. And is this the last chance? I mean, how many more ministerials can we have? Is this the last chance the WTO can prove itself as a, as a multilateral negotiating body? Thank you. All right, and the last question, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, one there and then one more. We'll, uh, no, two more, but quickly, please, okay? And then um, Pascal can handle five at once. Uh, Brian, B <laughs> Brian Beery, Washington correspondent, Europolitics. And the EU and US are, have this high-level group um, that's about to come up with a conclusion on whether to launch negotiations for a uh, EU-US free trade agreement. What's your view on whether that would be a useful exercise? Thank you. Pia? Laurie. Okay, yeah. Oh. Laurie, you, you go, go ahead, go ahead. Pia will be last. Laurie Wallach from Public Citizen. It follows on your question about adding non-traditional issues environment you mentioned or exchange rates to WTO. And given the rules already have some non-traditional issues, say from the GATT era of procurement or services, my question for the Director General is in the context of the WTO adapting to changing circumstances, why post-financial crisis does there seem to still be this divide between the view of the Secretariat with respect to the limits on financial regulation in the WTO GATT's rules relative to the member states who today in the Committee on Trade and Financial Services agreed that they do need a dedicated discussion about the problems of how the current rules limit the use of capital controls, certain kinds of regulatory rules, et cetera, the issues that UNCTAD and others have identified. It seems addressing some of those issues going forward would help the organization adapt to external realities. Thank you. Very good question. Pierre, the last one. 
No, no, that will be the last one. We, we, we don't have time. We're running out of time. Thank you, Pierre Jacquet from the Global Development Network, GDN. Uh, Pascal, you tended to dismiss uh, uh, current account imbalances and exchange rate issues as non-trade, and it's hard to disagree. At the same time, I suppose these issues make your life more difficult in terms of trade negotiations. So there is a connection to trade, at least indirectly. So my question is, what kind of world architecture would make your life easier? All right, Pascal, we have a few minutes to answer all this. <laughs> a monarchy. OK, on, on, whether, uh, on whether business uh, influences, should influence, uh, does influence uh, uh, trade negotiations, uh, answer is obviously yes. Uh, most contrary to what many people believe, uh, most trade negotiations, like most international negotiations, are not uh, negotiations uh, between countries, but by countries with themselves, uh, with their own domestic constituencies. Uh, and uh, true business does inform, shape, more or less, depending on political cycles, uh, depending on the country, uh, what their governments say. But the WTO remains an intergovernmental organization. It's not an inter-business organization. It's not an inter-NGO organization. It's an intergovernmental organization. Uh, and if you take the example of services, for instance, I you know the coalition of services industry in the US has had a big impact on framing the Doha mandate and uh, in reviving this uh, international services agreement, which is uh, worked out for the moment, whether it's a closed or open plurilateral, uh, the future will say. So it's, it's, it's an obvious case where you know, business is a key component. Uh, and in the stakeholder group I, I've uh, already mentioned, uh, which will report uh, for next year, I have included roughly half representatives of business because my own sense is that you know, they are the ones who know where trade obstacles are. They are the ones that can help drafting a to-do list in we should start by this and this and this and this. Not that they decide. Of course, this has to be mixed with many other factors and that's what you know, governments are there for. But th they, have a major, they have a major influence. Now, they certainly influence mm -hmm. the direction as the reality of their businesses changes. Uh, and the business agenda for WTO 10 years ago is not the same as the business agenda for WTO today. Why does trade facilitation, for instance, suddenly become a major issue, whereas, frankly speaking, uh, uh, at the Doha at uh, Seattle or Doha or Cancun, nobody ever heard of trade facilitation is because the world has changed. And again, the relative importance of these frictions to trade have changed. Uh, on whether uh, a package would be available, I think uh, there, there are two words that are worn out in WTO for the moment, which is deadlines and packages. <laughs> That's a reality. Uh, I'm sure a number of deals are doable. Trade uh, facilitation, environmental goods, uh, information technology agreement, accession of China to the government procurement agreement is a huge negotiation which is perfectly doable. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's $100 billion of trade a year that's at stake. What we did on, on, on facilitating uh, LDZ's accession to WTO is an important contribution to extending more rapidly the perimeter of WTO rules to countries who, for most of them, are heavily dependent on reaching out the global market to develop. Uh, so a variety of these things is doable, but Again, I would refrain uh, uh, if we want to be efficient uh, to uh, call this a package. 
And you know, there's, there's, there's no last chance alone in, in international organizations. Uh, take uh, disarmament, uh, take uh, whale fishing, uh, uh, take uh, negotiations in WTO about rules of origin, uh, which have been going on for 25 years. Uh, take the uh, EU uh, GCC uh, bilateral agreement, which has been going on for 32 years. Uh, time uh, is long uh, for the international system. Uh, EU-US uh, free trade agreement, uh, whatever uh, transatlantic uh, uh, sort of bilateral trade deal, frankly speaking, depends on what would be in there. Uh, it's not a question of philosophy, it's not a question of theology. Depends on whether this would be a step to a level uh, field uh, which is a multilateral one, or whether on the contrary it would create a convergence which would then cre create a problem for the others <laughs> Uh, that would have uh, uh, the choice of uh, either uh, stepping in without having participant to the negotiation or remaining out. Uh, but, you know, again, it all depends on what's in there. And frankly speaking, I have no clue of what will be in there. Uh, the only slight approximation of, of what could be in there is, uh, uh, is to be seen in the EU-Canada agreement which they are negotiating, uh, which mostly has to do with uh, regulatory issues and not with tariff issues. Uh. And that's the problem of these, uh, of these bilateral trade agreements. I mean, when it was about tariffs, there was a sort of automatic convergence to, you know, the more preferences you have in tariffs, the less preferences you have. And by the way, this is evidenced by the numbers and the average tariff preference today from the 350 bilateral agreements that are in force, the average level of tariff preference is 1%. Huh? And the amount of world trade that takes place under bilateral agreement tariff-wise is 15% of world trade. Uh, so, in a way, on the tariff side, not a problem. But as what really will matter in the future is non-tariff measures, then you bump into how do you level the playing field in non-tariff measures and whether bilateral preferences are or not self-eroding. And there, the answer is exactly the reverse of what it is in tariffs. If in order to trade more cars, Kamal, Kemal and myself agree on a uh, specific uh, car emission standard. And if I do this with John, whether this car emission standard will be the same or not, and whether, if it's not the same, what, what is going to happen in car trade between you and him, it's, it's a totally different picture. Huh? So in a way, if I'm right with this view that the problem of the future is addressing regulatory discrepancies much more than tariff differences or even uh, quantitative restrictions, then you have to relook at this bilateral versus multilateral in a, in a different way. Laurie Willis, one more of these uh, many exchanges we've had uh, where uh, we've uh, very nicely and very frankly uh, disagreed. And I won't change my view this time, Laurie, sorry about that. <laughs> you have the view, which is your view, that the rules of the GATT prevent countries which have accepted to open their financial market services to regulate their activity on prudential grounds. That's your point. It simply is not true. Whether I open or not my services market is one thing. 
The only commitment I take when I open my services market, when I do this, and as you know, not all do that, and some have done it in very, very different proportions, the only commitment that impacts my regulation if I do that is that I take the commitment to regulate domestic operators and foreign operators the same way. But it doesn't hinder at all, at all, my capacity to regulate them, including on prudential grounds. Huh? So if I want to decide that they have a equity uh, ratio or risk weighting or a liquidity coefficient, blah, 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 no problem. And by the way, and we've already discussed that many times, but <laughs> once more is never too much. If you, want, if you want an example of this, take Canada and US. Huh? Why did uh, in 08 uh, two systems which were totally open to one another trade-wise, huh? Canada and US in financial services is a totally level playing field. Why did the system explode on one side of the frontier and not on the other side of the frontier simply because it was properly regulated on one side and not properly regulated on the other side. Both members of the WTO, both members of the GATS, both having taken serious financial opening commitments under the services agreement, the problem was not a problem of trade opening, it was a problem of proper regulation. And again, there's nothing in the GATS that prevents me as a WTO member having accepted financial services opening commitment to regulate the way I want to do it. Nothing. So, as we say in French, uh, circuler, il n'y a rien à voir. Uh, I'm saying this because Pierre has, has uh, asked the last question. Of course, as as WTO DG, I would dream, and I am dreaming, of a stable, worldwide, well-ordered currency system. Of course, that would be a very important contribution to trade opening. It would ease many of the remaining frictions, risks, hedging necessities, calculations of whether I should do this or not, it would be stable, predictable, which is what the WTO is about. Which is why it all started with a fixed exchange rate on the one side, with the Bretton Woods institutions, and with the theory of an international trade organization, which, as you know, was built and agreed in the Havana conference, which aborted and then whoop, uh, uh, became uh, the GATT. But that's not the philosophy we're in since uh, exchange rates have disappeared. So I'm sure it would be a great contribution to trade opening and to the stability of uh, creating efficiency through trade opening if we had a more stable system. But I also know that it's a dream for the moment. But we can continue to dream. <laughs> anyway, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I think, you know, as expected always from Pascal, it was incisive, comprehensive, analytical, even political at some point. <laughs> you, fi you figure out which point that was. But many, many thanks, Pascal, for coming. Pleasure. And these are issues that we will debate very intensively here at Brookings, and I hope we'll have you again at some point. Thank you. No